In today's A-level IB video, we're going to be looking at inhibitors of enzymes. So with this video, we need to understand how an enzyme works. Remember that an enzyme is a protein. It acts on a substance known as a substrate, which binds to the enzyme's active site. And this is going to be very important when we look at the inhibitors of enzymes. For more in-depth look at how enzymes speed up reactions, you need to check out one of my earlier videos. However, as I've said, the video today is on inhibitors of enzymes. So what is an enzyme inhibitor? So hopefully you know the word inhibit, just a regular English word, and it means slows, prevents. So it's a substance that slows the rate of an enzyme-controlled reaction So how does it work? Well, we've looked up here to see how an enzyme actually acts. It acts on substrates which bind to the enzyme's active site. And obviously, if you can prevent the binding of the substrate to the enzyme, then you can slow the enzyme's activity. So to finish off our definition, an enzyme inhibitor is a substance that slows the rate of an enzyme-controlled reaction by preventing binding of the substrate to the active site of an enzyme. And that is a nice, complete definition. So what are the two types of enzyme inhibitor? The first type is a competitive inhibitor. So I've drawn a simple diagram here to show you how a competitive inhibitor works. Now hopefully you can see from the diagram that the competitive inhibitor has a very similar shape to the substrate molecule. And this means that it's able to bind to the enzyme's active site instead of the substrate. And obviously, if the correct substrate is no longer binding, then you can have no enzyme activity. So let's make a first note by saying that the competitive inhibitor is similar to the substrate molecule. and binds with the enzyme's active site, therefore preventing access by the substrate molecules. So let's now look at two different scenarios, one where we have a low substrate concentration. So in our first example, we only have three substrate molecules shown in green, and we have four competitive inhibitor molecules. It's all really a matter of chance as to whether the substrate binds to the active site. You've got a similar number of substrate molecules and competitive inhibitor molecules. Sometimes the substrate will bind, sometimes the competitive inhibitor will bind. However, in the second scenario, we see a higher substrate concentration. We see lots of green molecules. And if we look at a matter of chance now, it's far more likely that that substrate molecule will bind to the active site. And here the competitive inhibitor will have little impact. And now we're going to write an explanation. So at low concentrations of substrate, the competitive inhibitor binds to the enzyme's active site, preventing substrate entry. At higher substrate concentrations, two things are more likely. A substrate is more likely to come in contact with the enzyme's active site. And secondly, even if the inhibitor is bound to the enzyme's active site, the high concentration of substrates means that it's likely to displace the inhibitor and form an enzyme-substrate complex. So substrate molecules displace, they effectively boot out the competitive inhibitor. And a key example here is oxygen, which is a competitive inhibitor, and it competes with carbon dioxide for access to the active site of the enzyme Rubisco. Let's look at the second type of inhibitors you need to know about, which are the non-competitive inhibitors. And these are different from competitive inhibitors in the fact that they do not bind to the enzyme's active site Instead, they bind to another place on the enzyme, 
such as we can see here in the second diagram, and we call this other site an allosteric site. Now the effect that this has is that it changes the shape of the active site, meaning that the enzyme's typical substrate can no longer bind. So in our next point we want to say that these inhibitors don't stand on the laptop. That's the cat getting up to mischief as usual. The crucial thing with non-competitive inhibitors is that there is no point in trying to increase the substrate concentration in order to outcompete the inhibitor because once this non-competitive inhibitor is bound to an allosteric site on the enzyme, effectively the active site has changed shape. So there's no point trying to add more substrate molecules because they still won't be able to bind. And therefore you often find that non-competitive inhibition is permanent. Whereas before, with a competitive inhibitor, you could imagine that it would be temporary. So making a note of that now, adding more substrate molecules does not dislodge the inhibitor because non-competitive inhibitors and substrates are not competing for the enzyme's active site. Therefore, non-competitive inhibition is often permanent. really hope I've spelt permanent correctly, but yeah, that's a very key point. And an example of a non-competitive inhibitor is the amino acid alanine, which acts on the enzyme pyruvate kinase involved in respiration. Now, alanine is a non-competitive inhibitor. It binds to pyruvate kinase, therefore preventing the regular substrate entering its active site. So just to show you a little diagram, here we have alanine. It's the non-competitive inhibitor. It's bound to pyruvate kinase and it's bound to an allosteric site, so it hasn't bound to the active site, but by binding it has altered the shape of that active site. 